Marion, and I'll introduce you briefly, is a leading transport and cities expert with a long history in public policy. She's worked on tax policy for the Federal Treasury and led the design and development of the MyGov account. She's provided expert analysis and advice on labour market policy for the Federal Government, the Business Council of Australia and at the, at the Australian National University. Marion joined Grattan Institute in 2015 to establish the transport program, which she expanded to include cities in 2016. At Grattan, Marion has published on a wide variety of topics, including investment in transport infrastructure, cost overruns, value capture, traffic congestion, discount rates, and the way the COVID crisis is changing Australian cities. And you've addressed this group before, Marion, um, a couple of times, and I'd just like to welcome you back. You're among friends here, and we're very glad to have you speak to us tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here. I think last time I spoke to this group, um, I was talking about congestion in Melbourne, and um, so and we had a very lively discussion. But it was nice because we were actually in the uh, in the beautiful old room. So it's a bit of a regret for me, but I hope that we'll be back doing that again soon. Um, so James asked me to talk to you today about um, a report that I published um, a, a few months ago uh, called "The Rise of Mega Projects: Counting the Costs." And so today I'm going to explain that research to you. I'm going to tell you what we looked at, um, how we did it, and what we found, and also what we think governments should be doing about it. So um, our focus was national, but there is plenty of Victoria in what I've got to say, and there's plenty of Melbourne in it. So I'll give you the, the brief version first, in a nutshell. What we found is that Australian governments are committing to a record number of mega projects, mega transport projects, but that exposes taxpayers to a risk of mega cost overruns. Taxpayers paid $34 billion more on transport projects completed over the past 20 years than they were first told that they'd pay, or we were told that we would pay, I should say. But um, it, it's not just what's happened in the past. What's happening now um, is really something quite new and different. And that is that projects still under construction are costing even more than that. So cost overruns on just six mega projects have already blown out by 24 billion. Of course, it is well known that big projects are more prone to cost overruns. And I'll also show you that the overruns that they have tend to be bigger uh, as a fraction of the of the project size. Um, we do also continue to see plenty of projects going forward without a proper business case. So I'm going to share my screen with you. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to ask. Um, but let me go ahead. Uh, So this is the structure of what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I'm going to start by talking about what's happening uh, in the building that we're doing. Uh, then I'll talk about um, uh, why cost overruns are a problem, um, the size of cost overruns and some of the characteristics that put them at risk, and then to look at what we're doing today. The, the more detailed findings that I'm going to take you through today are based on our analysis of all transport infrastructure projects valued at $20 million or more and done for Australian governments between 2001 and the first quarter of 2020. So I'll start by um, showing you that we're building like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> This slide shows you the value of work under construction at each quarter since 2001. And, and I think there's two quite dramatic things that this chart shows you. So first of all, the growth in the value of work under construction in the past 10 years, and especially the past five years is very dramatic. Um, it's stepped up. It, of course, infrastructure is always quite lumpy. So, um, you know, you do get quarter to quarter variation and some year to year variation, but the trend is very clear. Um, there's just a, uh, this very large quantity of work under construction. And secondly, all the growth has been in these gigantic projects costing $5 billion or more. There's nothing much happening in the 1 billion and the 1 to 5 billion, but 
it's, it's all growing in these mega, mega projects. So it's quite a big shift in what's happening in the industry. During the, far, the past five years, um, the value of an average project has shot up too. So five years ago, the average project was worth 430 million, now 1.1 billion. Mm. So it's, the, it's a different kind of thing that we're doing. So, so this is, both of these two slides have been about things that are uh, in, in each quarter, what is currently under construction. But I'm going to now uh, show you completed projects. And what you can see here, I mean, again, it, because it is pretty lumpy year to year, we've made an average, a rolling average on it. But you, what you can see is that um, the five-year average is actually pretty steady. The huge jump up has really only just happened. <laughs> so it's just been since 2019. It's extremely recent. So now we're in a situation where governments are pushing transport infrastructure as stimulus spending. So the most recent Commonwealth budget included um, about one and a half times the usual sort of commitment um, for transport spending. Just to explain this chart, I don't know if everyone pours over budget papers like uh, some of us do, but um, you get four years worth of funding announced in a budget and they have different patterns. Often they, there's a bit of a ramp up time before they then ramp down. Um, but you can see between 2019 and 2020 just how much higher the Commonwealth's commitment uh, to transport infrastructure has been. And particularly if you think about the fact that they're trying to uh, focus it on smaller projects, not particularly successfully, I don't think, but that's what they're trying to do because they're quicker to get out the door. Large projects, um, of course, are generally not very good stimulus. Um, so they are slower to get off the ground. If they're not already underway, the planning phase takes a long time. You, you guys know that better than most people. Um, but there's also capacity constraints in engineering construction. Uh, so, you know, big infrastructure projects require uh, sophisticated equipment and sophisticated operators. Um, it's not, I think a lot of people have a bit of an image of um, the Great Depression and men with shovels on their shoulders. It's really not like that. It is much more of a high tech game. And, and so these people are not likely to be unemployed. In fact, if you go back a little bit before the pandemic, you can see how much growth there has been just in employment in this industry before the pandemic hit. So what that, what that tells you, so there's been a surge basically of 50% of, of the workforce in the three years to 2020. So what's going on here is um, that there was already a big ramp up before we start trying to do stimulus. The, I, I guess for these reasons, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about the idea of, of this being a good form of stimulus. Um, but there's another factor going on here in the environment that we're in right now, and that is the benefits. So in the, a world with COVID, I think the benefits of a lot of these projects um, are far more uncertain for two reasons. One is population growth. So um, it's fallen off a cliff um, and uh, we don't really have much of a sense of when the borders are likely to open um, and or, or kind of what the under what conditions that's going to occur. And yet the business case for most large projects is underpinned by population growth. So we had, um, I think, you know, we've seen that overseas migration essentially halt, um, but also fertility is getting lower. It's sort of uh, the long-term trend is very unclear. So that's the population side of it. But the other thing that's going on um, is that travel patterns are very uncertain or work and travel really. So we, again, um, it's hard to know how this is gonna shake down in the longer run. There's an awful lot of confident predictions in the papers pretty much every day about lots more working from home or lots more getting back to normal or kind of many variations on a theme. 
I mean, my feeling about this is we don't really know. So uh, that again is sort of casts a question mark, I think, over a lot of the, the major projects that are being fast tracked. So to, it, I guess to sum that up, we've got the environment being one where there has been an absolute explosion in mega projects in the very recent past. We've got governments wanting to add yet more to an already stretched industry. And whether those projects are even the right ones for a world with COVID, I think is an open question. So now I'm going to uh, go to a longer perspective, looking over two decades. Um, I guess thinking about overruns as a problem, as we enter this era of mega projects, um, we have cause to be wary because we've seen problems with cost overruns over the past 20 years. So my colleagues and I looked at cost overruns, cost outcomes, I guess, on public roads and rail projects completed over the past 20 years. And we found that taxpayers spent in total $34 billion more on these projects than we'd first been told that we'd spend. In other words, the final costs turned out to be $34 billion higher than the initial cost estimates. So this is a problem because when initial cost estimates are regularly and materially too low, they distort investment planning um, in several ways. So firstly, systematic underestimation of the costs of infrastructure projects makes infrastructure look more attractive than it really is relative to other spending priorities. And so it risks overinvestment in infrastructure. Also, underestimation on specific projects can distort project selection from amongst a pool of possible infrastructure projects. And thirdly, if unrealistic cost estimates are more prevalent for larger projects, then governments are more likely to overinvest in larger projects. And this is actually what our research suggests is happening. So I'm going to move now to this question of project size and the significance of it. In, basically, we find that bigger projects overrun more often and by more. So the first set of bars is the prevalence of of whether there is a cost overrun or not. And you can see that you're more likely, if your project is big, it's more likely to have a cost overrun. The second set of bars shows you uh, by how much it, the, uh, it will overrun if there is one. And again, you can see that the, uh, that the, uh, um, the amount by which it overruns is also larger if the project is larger. I should just mention, we have converted all the dollars here to today's dollars. So for projects with an initial cost estimate of a billion dollars or more, almost half ended up exceeding their initial cost estimate. This problem, in other words, is a very concentrated problem. It's not a case of small amounts adding up across the 33% of projects that had an overrun. Instead, it's a small number of very large cost overruns that are the key cause of the cost overrun problem. And that's what this slide is showing you. So this um, <clears throat> more than 80% of total cost overruns uh, were caused by just 14% of projects. The 14% that exceeded their initial cost estimate by more than 50%. This next slide shows you the dollar value of the overruns that have occurred over the past 20 years. Um, I'm not sure if my head is in the way, the way I'm seeing the screen is. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it's, it's showing you the kind of that um, there are a large number of small projects, that there's no doubt about that, but, um, but the problem is concentrated in this realm of the very large projects. Um, for the $1 billion plus projects that had an overrun, 
the overrun was on average more than a billion dollars. So what this means is, in fact, that sometimes the overrun is itself the size of a large project. I'm going to move on now to another factor, which is premature announcements. So premature projects that have a, an, um, a cost announced prematurely are more likely to have a cost overrun. We've defined a premature cost announcement as one that's made before a project has the regulatory and financial approvals it requires before it can actually proceed. So in practice, this often means something like a politician uh, gets up, often in the context of an election, and promises that they're going to build this road or this railway and it's going to cost $500 million and it'll open in 2023. So that, that's kind of what's typically happening here. Um, and I'll show you on this next slide um, what happens here. Only a third of projects actually do have a premature cost announcement of this kind, but these projects announce for, uh, account for 79% of the cost overrun, of total cost overruns. It's perhaps not surprising that the earlier the premature cost announcement, the worse it is. This slide shows you that. So there are these projects, uh, and uh, many of you may, may sort of be familiar with this phenomenon. Often when I talk to people in uh, government transport areas, they say, yeah, there are these projects that, that hang around for a long time and, and do have this kind of troubled life. Um, but this slide is certainly showing you that the average change in cost increases with the length of time between that initial cost announcement and construction actually getting underway. I guess the other dimension to this is that premature announcements often go hand in hand with larger projects. Almost half the projects that are initially expected to cost half a billion dollars or more had a premature cost announcement. So here's a slide that shows you that. Um, so you can see that uh, prematurely announced projects start out life bigger. They have an increase of 18% by the time they're formally committed. But it doesn't end there. They have further cost increases by an average of 16% by the time the project's completed. So it's a lot higher than the increase, which is 13%, for projects that are announced in a more orthodox way. So the current, I'm going to talk to you now about the current uh, mega projects um, because they're, they're causing a lot of problems, um, as you know, not just in Victoria, but um, around the country. Um, so th this is sort of really talking about the here and now. Um, and, and keeping in mind what I showed you at the beginning, beginning that the average project size is now much larger than it's been before. Um, you could, in fact, call this an era of mega, mega projects. So this slide shows you that um, projects costing $5 billion or more were almost unheard of 10 years ago. Now we've got nine of them under construction. So we've looked at what's been happening with the costs of just six of these mega, mega projects. And we've found that in total, the costs across these six projects are currently expected to be $24 billion higher than initial cost estimates. So you can see here um, what we've got in Victoria, Northeast Link and Inland Rail and the Westgate Tunnel. Um, but by, but there's, there are these fraught problems uh, in other states as well. Um, so um, I guess what I'd say about this is um, these projects, um, so they are often announced prematurely. And I think it, there wouldn't really be a problem with politicians doing this if we had a robust 
process for cancelling the ones that on closer scrutiny turned out to be not really worth proceeding with. But we don't have such a process. So once, um, once those promises are made, public promises are made to invest, then the project invariably does go ahead. And so the decision to invest actually is really when that announcement is made because you know, politicians want to keep their promises regardless of how much due, due diligence has gone into the promise before they make it. So I guess it does seem that the problem of cost overruns uh, is persisting. I'm going to just now talk to you about what we recommended governments should do. And I've got two slides on this. Firstly, what we think governments should do straight away. And secondly, more structural things so that we don't end up in this position in the future. So I'll start with the uh, immediate. Um, so firstly, um, to conduct an immediate stock take. This is really just to look at what is happening right now because you can see how much the landscape has changed in such a short space of time. And it will allow projects, uh, governments, uh, um, to review and to reprioritize their projects in light of COVID-19 and this push for stimulus, as well as just the quantum of work underway. Secondly, a, dis a continuous disclosure regime. So taxpayers are the investors in public infrastructure and they have a right to know about material developments in projects, just as shareholders of companies do. Thirdly, to specify the range and status of cost estimates. History shows that initial cost estimates are often materially too low. Governments should be as clear as possible about how much work has gone into them. Uh, so that, and they should reconcile from one estimate to the next as the range of uncertainty narrows. It's interesting because Infrastructure New South Wales has actually put out short guidance on how, um, which I think is primarily for politicians, but you know, for anyone, I guess, really wanting to talk about these big projects and the costs associated with them. And they, they give a, um, a bit of guidance on how to do it, um, what sort of ranges to give, and at, at what um, sort of how to convey to the public um, what is and isn't known about projects. I think it also um, does give governments more cover and, and more opportunity to back out if they if they form the view that um, an early idea that they floated wasn't such a great idea if they haven't made a hard and fast commitment. So that's a third recommendation. And fourthly, um, to require independent assessment of infrastructure decisions. Um, so, that's, so this is really um, reflecting the common view that the business cases are often of, of not of a very high standard. Um, so to try to improve the tools by which decision makers inform themselves to make their decisions. That's the set of recommendations uh, to do right now. I'm going to move now to my final slide, which is, oh no, let me tell you, sorry, first about this, the additional transparency, um, I beg your pardon. Uh, so so th this slide is really showing you kind of why there is a problem with business cases, which is um, partly governments just don't bother doing them, or they certainly make their decisions well before they've got a business case. Um, I think the having more transparency doesn't stop elected representatives from doing what they're elected to do, which is make decisions, including on infrastructure, but it does make them make it more costly for them to do that without proper care for spending public money. When you think about this um, sort of fairly startling uh, slide about um, the the lack of, or the scarcity of business cases. I'd say we also see governments not particularly tuned into the, cycle, the business cycle. Um, and we think that that's perhaps a hint as to um, one of the benefits that we could get if we were a bit better at learning from history. Um, we found cost overruns were less frequent and smaller on average in the period from 2015 to 2018 than the long-term averages. So the trend hasn't been sustained into 2019, but it is suggestive we think that costs might have come down as the mining investment boom ended and there was spare capacity in the construction sector. So um, this is just a slide that shows you um, 
that possible explanation. So you see the flatter uh, period um, between 2014 and 2017. And so um, it, it does suggest an opportunity to get, uh, to manage the pipeline better and to get better prices from the construction companies um, and, and potentially even for one state to coordinate with another, although I think um, it's a little hard to imagine that happening. So uh, my final slide now is how to, uh, uh, the sort of structural changes that would prevent us being in this position in the future. So firstly, mega projects should be the last, not the first resort. So smaller projects are less risky. They often have better benefit cost ratios. They're better if you want to do stimulus. Um, in a mature city like Melbourne or like Sydney, um, arguably the, the need for mega projects is less than in a less mature city. There's an, uh, an awful lot of, of useful uh, transport infrastructure work that could be done that doesn't entail mega projects. That's the first one. Uh, the second recommendation is to collect the data. Um, we don't collect data on completed projects, and so we don't know how to do better cost estimation. So a, we see a lack of data, for example, showing up today because, um, or in the fact that um, there's insufficient provision for worst case cost outcomes. So the gap between the median or P50 cost estimate and the uh, P90 or 90th percentile cost estimate um, in business cases is usually around 7%. The P90 is only about 7% above the P50. But when we look at all the projects, we think it should be uh, more like 49% higher. So the, these you can get these quite extreme cost outcomes and they're just not being provided for in the cost estimates. So it's a bit of a technical point, but the bottom line here is uh, if you don't collect the data, you keep on making the same mistakes. Thirdly, to improve the consistency of cost estimation handbooks. In 2016, there were 57 guideline documents and handbooks on how to estimate project costs in Australia put out by Australian governments. Four years later, seven of them have been retired, but another five have sprung up. It, it makes it very difficult, the relationships between them. Some of them I think are a bit misleading, um, but they have gaps, they have a lot of duplication, they explain the same basic toolkit in an unbelievable variety of ways. And finally, publish post-completion reviews of big projects. This is another way of learning from history. Um, it's particularly difficult to know if the benefits were realised and and people like Grattan Institute can't do that because we don't have, like no one bothers to go back and check. So we have quite a poorly disciplined way of managing these projects and failing to learn from history. So just to conclude, I've, I've shown you today what the mega projects landscape's like in Australia right now. Uh, there has been an explosion in mega projects in the very recent past. Governments are wanting to add yet more to this already stretched industry and not sure whether they're the right projects. I think there is a lot that we could be doing better. So I've shown you some ideas, I think that would shine a light on and bring a tighter discipline to these enormous investments that governments are making on behalf of us. So thank you for listening. Um, I can see there's a, a bunch of questions which I'm happy to go to or um, do it in a open forum. How do you want to do this, Jonathan? Yeah, so you're right. There's a bunch of questions. I've I've got a couple that I might put to you from the chat as well, but I'd encourage people to raise their hand as Tom has by going down to the bottom of the screen where there's a reaction, a little smiley face with a plus, and above that is a, is a raise hand function. And that'll put you in a speaker's list, which then I can call on uh, interspersed with the, the questions in the chat. So with your permission, Marion, I'll, I'll, I'll read out some of these questions in the chat. Um, and David's asked a bunch, but I'm, I'm going to go and start with a theme here, which is David's question, which follows, and it goes, cost estimates are a problem, but how accurate are the estimates of project benefits, both accuracy and magnitude? Um, 
Yeah, so I'd love to know the answer to that question. And I think it's such an important question. So, um, but governments don't collect the data and they certainly don't publish it. So um, it's just impossible to say. And, it, and what that means is you don't have the discipline put back on those producing the new estimates for new projects going forward. So um, yeah, it would be very good to know that. Thank you. And before I go to another chat question, I'll throw to Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Marion. Thanks. And when you started talking, you said about how these projects are announced just before elections. And I thought of straight away about the suburban rail loop, which was announced a couple of months before the last state election. And at the time, people thought that this is a major public transport infrastructure and therefore potentially good. But now, now looking at it, it's due to be finished in 2050, which is 29 years away. So, and they've chosen the dearest way of building public transport underground heavy rail. Given what you've said, could you comment about the, and the suburban rail loop was no, inf no input from Infrastructure Victoria, no department behind it, no policy behind it. It was an announcement made by a very small unit within there that looked at it was planned without knowledge of the Northeast Link, which crosses it twice. And, you know, there's, there's so much yet. It's the biggest project we're ever going to build. In 29 years, will public transport be really heavy rail underground? It, it's hard to imagine that when you look at the lightweight vehicles in our building, and, and this is an enormous cost so far in the future, and the potential for cost overruns are massive. So would you call that, you know, the, the ultimate mega project with with its planning and you know can you comment on the suburban rail loop and the way that's been envisaged and planned uh yeah so um it it does seem like a particularly dreadful example of a project announced without appropriate scrutiny um it's going to if it sort of is built in its entirety it will be the most expensive transport infrastructure project ever undertaken in Australia. Um, uh, but it, yeah, very minimal scrutiny and um, yeah, look, and announced in the, con it, like it's a textbook case, it's an extreme case. Um, so what can I say? Um, yeah, well, like in the end, um, we have, our processes are far from perfect, but we do have processes for deciding priorities and um, working out what things are going to cost. And, um, and I think sort of not having a business case done and doing one afterwards um, make, you know, puts pressure very clearly on, um, we know what the answer is supposed to be. So there's a whole lot of um, reasons why that's a particular, it's an outstanding example of what not to do, in my opinion. Thanks, Tom. Th th thanks, Marion. Um, before I go to Bernadette, who's got her hand up and has also a question in the chat, I'm going to ask a question posed by Simon Stainsby from Moreland, who asks, does Infrastructure Victoria have the data collection and post-project evaluation capacity that Grattan Institute says they don't have? And if IV doesn't have the capacity, what will they need to do to develop this capacity? Yeah, one of the um, observations I'd make um, about the I bodies, so every state now has one, and we also have Infrastructure Australia, is IV is a bit of a, they're all a bit different. Um, they all have different jobs. IV is um, at one extreme of that in that it's uh, much less involved in individual projects than the I bodies in other states. And so, um, I think if they were here tonight, they'd probably say this is probably more one for major projects Victoria rather than for them. I think it doesn't hugely matter in a way who does it. Um, in other states, it, the eye body would make more sense. Um, so they, um, so if we just sort of take it a little bit more generally, there's no reason that the government couldn't do this. Um, but the fact is around the country, they don't do it. Um, I think it, it could, I mean, I used to think that Infrastructure Australia could coordinate this, but um, sometimes waiting for uh, Commonwealth coordination can be waiting a long time. And there's sort of no reason really why, particularly the big states couldn't get together and say, here's what we'll collect and here's the format that we'll collect it in and then 
it's easy to pull our data and then suddenly we've got more data more data is more powerful there aren't you know in the end there's not that many projects the states are not that different so there's a whole lot of things that could be done pretty readily it, it does take resources i can't deny that but um but the process itself is not that complicated to collect the data post-project evaluation um, is costly um, and you need to bake it in from the beginning but um, not doing it is also costly and and that's where we're at at the moment thank you marion and well said now to bernadette thomas go ahead thanks jonathan um marion you've i guess you've kind of partly answered my question but it is around how often those post project reviews are conducted and how often if they are by by someone who's independent of the project. Um, so maybe I'll add a, an, another <laughs> um, bit onto the question just around how often are they actually um, sort of set up at the start of the project, knowing that, you know, there's sort of somebody external, um, you know, making an assessment of the project as it's implemented and then sort of at the end as well. Yeah, so I think um, I'll tell you what I know about this, which is, um, slightly out of date. So I wrote to all the states and territories maybe three years ago and asked them um, if they had done any and no one had. So the in the Federal Department of Infrastructure, the Bureau of Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Economics did a very historical study of I think about seven projects from I can't recall the exact number. Um, so they they chose ones that were in the distant past so that no government would be embarrassed and but but then but they were very much after the event so the point you raise about um someone so i guess they were independent the victory was independent of the projects so good on that point but um if you don't set the project up so that you collect the data that you're going to need to evaluate it then you can't evaluate it particularly after the passage of years so um, unless a, a state or territory has done anything, has done any in the last few years, um, I think the answer is uh, approximately zero. Um, and it is something I keep a pretty close eye on. So I'm sort of reasonably confident, but not 100%. Thanks, Marion. Thanks, Bernadette. Jeff Alton, MAV, asks, in the current global low interest rate environment, do you have any thoughts about the involvement of private sector finance complicating decision making during project development? Um, so it's a low interest rate environment for everybody and governments can borrow more cheaply than companies. Um, so that's pretty much always true. And the reason, well, there's a few reasons, but uh, they basically always can. Um, so the, does it complicate the question? Um, there's no shortage of, um, people willing to lend to Australian companies or Australian firms. So getting finance is just not a problem. Uh, getting funding is a much harder question. Um, I think so. Um, I don't know if, is that kind of what you're what your question is driving at? It was really about the fact that when you set up a financing deal and structure at the start of a project, you sort of you become a bit bound to deliver that financing structural outcome in terms of what the particular asset is or the service outcome is. And so you lose flexibility because as soon as you try and <clears throat> change that arrangement, then you've lost capacity to negotiate. So it's really about you lose, my view would be you lose flexibility by having that private sector financing at the front because you, you don't have that capacity to change or optimise as you go through because you're committed at the start of a process. I was just wondering if you sort of, that, that had been part of your thinking or have you yeah. observed that anywhere? It is part of my thinking. I'm, I'm preparing to publish a report in May on procurement um, so I have been thinking about that question quite a lot. I think um, the way I think about it is uh, often governments love to involve private finance precisely for the reason you say it ties their hands and it, it, it so they're, they're more impervious to political pressure. For example, 
the quantum of tolls, that, those kinds of things, which would be very hard if a minister was in charge. And also, they essentially tie the hands of future governments, not 100%, but they make it very difficult. So um, I, my sense is that um, those, those reasons are very attractive to governments when they do involve private finance. Um, but, and so you can sort of see it as a negative or as a positive, and there's probably actually elements of both. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff, and thank you, Marion. That's an excellent question and really goes to the heart of the current mega projects underway in Melbourne. Mm. Um, Simon uh, oh, answers that question by saying in the chat at, at the 1859 time code, as the sums become larger, the financial instruments used to finance them become more complex. Today's money based on hypothecated revenue. Would anyone else like to ask a question? And if so, just go to the reactions button and, and raise your virtual hand. Uh, David, go ahead. Um, thanks, John. So uh, there were four other questions that I put in uh, earlier in the chat. Um, I'm happy with any of those, or does anyone else uh, want to pick one of those? Um, you, you, you pick your favorite. Okay. Um, so I suppose from a historical perspective, um, uh, what sort of job cost impacts would there have been uh, for the last, say, five or ten years of projects if we were still using that 1930s men's with shovel, uh, shovels concept instead of everything being mechanised? Assuming that our HNS would be okay with it, which is a challenge in and of itself. But did, did you say what sort of cost overruns would there be? Or um, what would be better at estimating the cost or something like that? Um... <laughs> hmm. I don't expect it to ever happen, but it's an interesting question. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, uh, it's a study for another day. Fair enough. I, I, or um, um, uh, cost overruns, were they a massive problem in the 1930s, 1940s as well, to the same magnitude? Uh, people do sometimes talk about the Opera House, the Sydney Opera House, <laughs> um, which was a very fraught mega project. Um, and, um, and in fact, they often use it as an argument for saying, oh, when this is built, you won't care about the cost, you'll be happy because you'll have this marvellous thing. And, um, and I think it is true that once these projects are built, we do use them, there's no doubt about it. And, and it's not that they don't have any value to the community. I, I think, I mean, there is a sadder story to the Sydney Opera House, which is um, it destroyed the architect. It was a devastating experience and, you know, in, in many ways. And, and I think, um, yeah, so the fact that we do now love that piece of infrastructure doesn't make it an unmitigated good news story, um, particularly in the process. Okay, Th thanks, Marion. And th thanks for your question, David. I look forward to the, the movie, um, which is following the zombie apocalypse, how we finish the suburban rail project using spades. <laughs> there, there'll be a lot of unemployed councillors that we can draw on and uh, it'll make a great film. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marion, for, for your presentation and 